Good afternoon. Welcome to today's COVID-19 update with the county's public health experts coming to you from the safety of their private offices. Today, you will hear from the county's director of public health, Dr. Von Dovernoso, and Dr. Henning Ansorg, the county's public health officer. Following their updates, we will open it up to questions from the news media. This press conference is being interpreted in Spanish by Carlos Saracedo and in American Sign Language by Shelley Lawrence. Videos of the press conference will be available shortly after the conclusion of the press conference in English and Spanish on the county's YouTube channel at CSB TV 20. And with that, I will turn it over to County Public Health Director, Dr. Von Reynoso. Thank you, Gina. And good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. Uh, I'd like to start this week's uh, briefing with a uh, with co by covering our data trends in Santa Barbara County. I'd like to note that since January, Santa Barbara County's case rate has significantly declined. How, however, in the past week, our case numbers have not decreased. In fact, our adjusted case rate recently increased. If this trend continues, we will not be eligible to move to the orange tier. We then must all be extra cautious at this time. And that means diligently practicing the masking, the social distancing and limit gatherings. Next. I'd like to give you a, an update on our vaccination efforts. We have received 194,360 doses so far. And of those, we have administered 101,535 first doses. We have administered 54,661 second doses. And we have administered 4,720 the single Johnson and Johnson doses. Of all the vaccines that we have received, we have achieved a 92.9% .9 into arms. The remaining percentage, 17.1, are scheduled to be given in upcoming appointments. Next. Currently, I'd like to refresh everyone's memory, knowledge about who is eligible. All community members 50 plus years of age are eligible. In addition, 16 to 49 years old with serious underlying health conditions can get appointments. We are continuing our efforts to vaccinate ag and food service workers, education and childcare workers, emergency services workers, and the remaining phase 1A healthcare workers. Coming up on April 15th, all community members 16 and above will be eligible for a, a, a vaccine. However, we will begin on April 12th making it available to community members 16 plus at only our Santa Barbara County community vaccination clinics. Next. I'd like to share with you some photos of our vaccination clinics in Lompoc. We are concluding a very successful week-long clinic in Lompoc. By the end of our clinic on Saturday, we will have administered over 4, 9,450 vaccines. To give you an idea, each day, we have about 100 people working in roughly 70 positions in order to operate the clinic. We are supported by state staff, public health staff, and staff from other county departments. I also appreciate our various community partners who are providing interpreters. Next. Upcoming we will have vaccination clinics in Santa Maria. Appointments are available now, and I highly encourage all community members to schedule your vaccine appointment. In addition to our clinics, hospital, 
pharmacies, primary care partners continue to serve all eligible groups. And our appointments for the community vaccination clinics in Santa Barbara in Santa Barbara will be opened on Thursday, April 8th. Next. We are still in the red tier and we have been here since March 16th. At this point in time, because of our case rate, we have not met the orange tier criteria. We do need to decrease our case rate to below 5.9 and unfortunately, as I just shared, our case rate is inching upwards, definitely in the wrong direction. Our case rate needs to decrease in order for us to move forward to the orange tier. Next. Thus, please do your share so we can decrease our case rate. Please continue wearing your mask, maintain social distance, get tested, and definitely schedule your vaccine appointment as soon as possible. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Ansorg, our County Health Officer. Thank you, Director Dovinoso. Good afternoon, everyone. As you just heard, we are very pleased with our progress in getting Santa Barbara County vaccinated. At this point, around 50% of our population age 65 and above is fully covered. 20% of our population age 16 and above are already vaccinated. The eligibility for everyone age 16 and up, regardless of underlying risk factors, will very soon start on April 12th at our Superpod in Santa Barbara at the Hilton Oceanfront Hotel. And on April 15th in all participating pharmacies, hospitals, and clinics. The vaccines continue to prove to be very safe and effective. There's new scientific data that came out this week, and it shows that only 9% of fully vaccinated people with the Pfizer can still catch the virus. Out of this small percentage of 9%, only 10% will not develop symptoms when catching the virus. What this means is it, in a sense, confirms that only 1% of vaccinated people could still be able to spread the virus unknowingly. This is indeed excellent news. The CDC, as well as the California Department of Public Health, are actively adjusting their guidances on travel and other activities to reflect that fully vaccinated people are safe to travel and socialize with other vaccinated folks. There are still requirements in place, but it definitely allows for more freedom. I want to encourage everyone to register for their vaccination as soon as possible. The more people are vaccinated, the lower the risk for variants to take over and for another surge to occur. Even though the CDC has come out with allowing domestic and international travel for vaccinated people, it is still very important to consider the widespread of new variants. For instance, the new surge in Michigan is fueled by the faster and more efficiently spreading UK variant of this virus known as B117. Fortunately, our vaccines are effective against these concerning variants. Our local team at UCSF, uh, no UCSB of course, and Cottage Hospital has seen an increase in the UK variant in our surveillance data. However, not to the degree of other areas in the country. Given that our new case rate locally has plateaued over the past week, we continue to urge everyone to keep up with socially distancing, wearing masks where recommended, Avoid crowds by all means. Remember, outdoor activities remain to be much safer than any indoor activities. And please get the vaccine as soon as possible. Thank you for your cooperation. Thank you, Dr. Ansorg. And now we'll go to questions from the media. First up, we have Blake Devine with KYT. Hey guys, uh, first question for, uh, for me, just what is the reason behind our COVID-19 cases actually increasing a little bit over the past week? 
Um, great question, Blake. And that's the question we've been asking ourselves. Uh, our EPI team uh, and uh, are looking at the cases and it looks like the small uptick, the inching upwards may be a result of reopening uh, activities. Uh, we are seeing that the pandemic is shifting towards younger and unvaccinated people who may be uh, expanding on their social activities. Uh, when we look at the data uh, this past week, in terms of age, there is a higher than average uh, increase among the 20 year olds. In terms of occupation, it looks like increases in college and university students uh, as well as continued proportion of clerical management workers. Uh, we're also seeing an increase in proportion of cases among whites, although Latinos still are the majority of cases. So that is our um, analysis for this week. And then I guess I'll pass it over to Dr. Ensor, but um, are you concerned at all by the cases rising um, and just kind of stopping the good progress that we've had uh, up to this point. Um, am I concerned? Yes, I am concerned because we've seen a very continuous decline over the last six weeks or so, and uh, it has stalled over the last week. So um, that, that, that always raises the level of concern uh, for us public health officials, obviously. Um, and uh, we are grappling with, uh, with an explanation, as uh, the director just uh, explained. Um, we are also seeing that we have um, more of these variants in our county. That means this type of virus spreads faster and more quickly. That's why it's overtaking the old wild type of the virus. And um, that, will, that will play into, uh, into the potential for a surge. Now, be advised that the vaccine is incredibly effective against these mutations. And the more people are vaccinated, the less uh, the virus can spread. So that is basically our golden ticket out of this pandemic is to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. And that's what we are attempting to help with. Makes sense to me. Uh, last question, either of you guys can take a shot at this one, but uh, what can people do if they lose their vaccination card? Vaughn, is that a question for you? Yes, I'm sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Uh, if you have lost your vaccination card, uh, you could get a replacement from the place that you uh, achieved your vaccination, or uh, ultimately we can support you in uh, searching the uh, state database and supply you with that replacement. But I would advise you to uh, seek a replacement from the, uh, the place which you re uh, got the vaccination from. And how important is it to have that card in a hard copy uh, somewhere, whether it's your wallet or safe somewhere safe at home? Um, how important is that to hold on to and not lose? I think it's very, very important as uh, nationally and statewide, we are considering uh, additional activities that vaccinated people uh, can participate in. So it's critical that you hang on to that vaccination card, keep it in a safe place and take a photo of it and keep it on your, um, your, uh, your, your, your phone, but definitely safeguard it so that you don't lose it. Makes sense, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Blake. And next up, uh, and by the way, we have a lot of questions in the queue. Uh, next up is Malia Martin with Santa Maria Sun, and then who will be followed by KSBY. Hi there, uh, good afternoon. Um, so first I just have a numbers question. Um, what was the number of doses that the county received in the most recent state allocation? And how does that number compare to the allocation before that? Just wanna make sure I have those numbers right. can answer that if you give me a second. Sure, no problem. 
at the most recent uh, allocation that we receive from the state is 4,400 to the public health department. And what was the allocation that we received right before that one from the state? I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you well. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, what was the allocation that we received right before that, like the most recent one before that one? I'm just kind of trying to see that progression and in increase in doses. Um, I don't have that information readily, but more than happy to email that to you, Malaya. Okay, that'd be great. Do you, can you say for certain that it did increase that? It did. Up? It did increase. Okay, great. And then um, one other quick question. Um, I've heard some folks who have the opportunity to get vaccinated, but are um, saying that they're actively avoiding getting the Johnson and Johnson vaccine because of its reported lower efficacy rates and are kind of opting to wait till they can get the two doser. What would you say in response to that mentality around the vaccine? I would say that the best vaccine is the one available to you right now. Thank you. And may, may I add to that, maybe uh, the Johnson & Johnson was approved or uh, gained the auth um, authorization later. So we don't have real world data that just came out, out for the Pfizer and Moderna. So it's not quite fair to compare the two with each other. Just the trial data are not good enough to make that call. Um, but even with the trial data, the Johnson & Johnson uh, it looked very good. So um, um, that's, that's all I can say. I, I would not hesitate uh, to take the Johnson Johnson myself if I hadn't been vaccinated yet. Thank you so much, Malia and Dr. Ansord. Next, we're going to Erin Fay with KSBY. Thank you so much. Um, how will Santa Barbara County interpret the new CDPH guidelines for indoor and outdoor activities? Um, Santa Barbara County will fall um, in line with the very recently released uh, guidelines from the state that allows gatherings, um, that allows indoor activities and outdoor activities based on the tier color that our county is in. So we will be lockstep uh, in, in following those new guidelines. Thank and you. May I add that this is the first time also that the state acknowledges that there is more leniency for people with um, who are fully vaccinated or who had a recent negative test. So uh, if you look at this guidance closely, you will see that um, it, is, it is more permissive for people who are fully vaccinated and then hopefully will motivate more people to get the shot. Thank you both. Next up, we are going to Laura Place with Santa Maria Times. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, my first question, um, I was wondering whether there are certain um, professions um, where people who aren't from Santa Barbara County but work, um, but work in the county could get a vaccination in the county, like if they are a slow resident but if they work at a hospital in Santa Barbara County, they could get vaccinated in our county. So. Does that apply to only certain professions and which ones, if it does? No, that applies to uh, all professions. If you work in Santa Barbara or if you live in Santa Barbara, you are eligible for a vaccine. Okay, do you have any estimates as to like the number of people who've gotten a vaccine that might not be residents of the county, but actually just work in the county? I don't have that information readily available. Okay, no worries. One last question. Um, this has to do with the state's goal, um, you know, for reaching a threshold of four million vaccines administered in those 400 zip codes, you know, in that lowest health equity quartile. I know they really publicized it once we reached that two million mark, and then that led to some, you know, um, reconfiguring of the um, case rate requirements for the different tiers. So, and I know the um, threshold for the orange tier will become a little looser once we reach 4 million. And I was just wondering if you've heard any, you know, update from the state as to how their progress towards that goal is going, because I haven't heard anything in a while. Sure. So as of this morning, uh, we, the state, it stands at about 3.8 million. Uh, we anticipate that as a state, we will reach that 4 million mark within three to five days. Okay. Well, if we did, wouldn't that kind of 
um, really increase our chances, even if we are kind of flatlining or increasing with cases to be uh, prepared? No, because uh, to get into the orange, we would still need to have our case rate below 5.9. And as it stands right now, we are not there. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Laura. And next up, we are going to Fab Fabiola Navarrete with Two Tiempo Digital. Fabiola, are you? Yes, allowed? yes, sorry. Okay. Hello, hello. Good afternoon, sorry. Okay, my first question is about the Johnson and Johnson vaccines that were lost. Do you know how many doses were lost and how was the specific situation about this? There, there were no uh, vaccines lost for us. There were there was a loss at the uh, production facility, okay. um, but it hasn't affected us directly as of yet. We, as far as I recall, we are slated to receive about 5,000 doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine next week. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. And my, my next question is about the budget that the county, Santa Barbara County, still have, still has to keep fighting this pandemic. Uh, uh, we just want to know if you still have enough financial resources, because as we all know, we've been uh, in this situation for, for one year, no? Great question, Fabiola. I think that we are very, very grateful that the recent federal allocation to our county and the recent allocation specifically to the public health department from the state uh, puts us in a very solid uh, uh, financial situation to continue to resource our pandemic responses. So we are getting funded by the uh, federal government as well as the state government um, and, and very supported by both uh, so that we can continue being, uh, being uh, responsive uh, to our county. And, okay. and if, I, if I could add Fabiola, this is a good time to let everyone know, the public know mm -hmm. that the county's budget workshops are coming up on April 12th, 14th and 16th which are also uh, broadcast live on CSB TV and through the countyofsb.org website. And so of course, it'll be a good time to hear about the county's finances and how, um, how we're doing. And, and certainly uh, the funding that we've received will be part of the discussion. So I, we encourage everyone to, to tune into that. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And this is not a question, but uh, this is just, uh, something that I need to tell you, we want to thank you for all your effort because now our Hispanic audience is getting more and more appointments to get vaccinated and we just thank you for that. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you for your partnership. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Fabiola. And next up, we are going to Atmica Iyer with the Daily Nexus. I hope everyone's having an awesome Friday. Um, my first question is about the fact that Isla Vista has uh, two potential events that could increase transmission, which is um, students coming back from spring break and Deltopia. So I know we've talked about it before, um, considering that we were uh, discussing or you were discussing about how um, we're currently in the red tier. I was wondering if these two events have the potential to put us back in the purple tier or keep us in a hiatus in the red. I think both. Uh, that is a worry that as we have spring break and we have increased social gatherings, that there is increased likelihood of cases uh, uh, skyrocketing. And so that is why we have partnered, the county has partnered with UCSB, as well as the city of Goleta, as well as the Ivy Community District to make sure that there are uh, no large gatherings, that there are safe, low risk activities through this weekend. 
And so um, I am hoping that uh, all the residents uh, in the community will adhere to the safety precautions that we have set forth, which is really minimize the social gathering and um, continuing to wear the masking and uh, social distance is critical. Thank you so much. Um, I have two more questions. Uh, the first one is a bit of a clarification. So um, in pre previous uh, press conferences, Dr. Ansorg, I believe you mentioned that um, the UK variant and the California variant um, have a similar level of um, increased transmission, if that's the right way to say that. Now that we are seeing more um, cases of the UK variant, what does that mean in the sense of um, how the county is going to head uh, in the direction of how many cases we're likely to see of both types? Yes, um, so uh, the data that we have from our local monitoring is not completely representative because it's a very small number of samples. We are anticipating results this uh, next Wednesday, the Wednesday of next week, where we have um, a bigger number of uh, results that will more um, accurately reflect our not yeah our our situation with regard to the variants. Um, but um, this UK variant is just I, I always like to compare them to runners. It's just faster because it can spread quicker. So it goes because it infects somebody sooner than the garden variety type virus, it's, it's just more successful in dominating um, the virus spread. Now, the California type is not quite as fast, but it's faster than the garden variety type. So they are basically uh, competing for um, people that can get infected. And uh, that is the case here, but um, to some degree, the California variant seems to be a little bit protective, if I may say so, um, even though it's not quite, quite as uh, um, fast as the UK variant, it's still faster than the other one. And um, uh, we will see. I mean, uh, initially the, the modeling uh, did say that uh, across the country by end of March, and the UK variant would be the dominating strain. That has not been proven to be accurate for California, and most likely due to this to, due to this California variant. But I will have better information next week after Wednesday when we get UCSB results again. Awesome, thank you so much. I have one last question, which is way, 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 way into the future, but considering that um, we're opening up eligibility to people 16 and up um, in a few weeks, which is amazing and insane all at the same time. Um, do you guys have an idea of how long it will take for our county um, to have herd immunity? Great question. Um, we've done some modeling uh, using state tools and at the rate of vaccinations and at the rate of, uh, of uh, cases, uh, if we don't sharply increase and if we can maintain a decrease in our case rates, we anticipate reaching that immunity level, the beginning of that immunity level sometime in July. Thank you so much. Thank you. Atmika and everyone, that actually was our last question, which concludes today's press conference. Uh, the Board of Supervisors is in session again this coming Tuesday, April 6th. Um, the agenda does include a COVID-19 update. Uh, so that's worth tuning into shortly at, um, after 9 a.m. Otherwise, the next press conference is Friday, April 9th at 4.30 p.m. In addition, our county public health experts are live each Thursday on KEYT in the 11 a.m. news broadcast. For ongoing information and links to the county's public health data dashboard, vaccine information, FAQs, and more, the web address is listed there on the screen. And again, it's publichealthsbc.org. For vaccine appointment assistance, call 211 and select option four. 
And with that, we thank everyone for joining us today and we wish you all a safe, healthy and happy weekend. And we will see you next week. Thank you and good night.